For several years during the month of July, Mental Health America has created campaigns to bring awareness to the unique struggles that underrepresented groups face in regard to mental illness in the United States. Our efforts aim to extend and honor the work of Phoebe Moore Campbell, a mental health advocate, author, and speaker. In June 2008, July was officially recognized by Congress as B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. As we continue to honor her work, we also recognize that people and language evolve. So MAJ has chosen to remove the word minority from our materials. Instead, we are using a different designation, BIPOC, that we believe more fairly honors and distinguishes the experience of Black, Indigenous people and people of color. Moving forward, MEJ will refer to our efforts in July as centered around BIPOC Mental Health Month. If you want to learn more about BIPOC Mental Health or BB Moore Campbell, please visit mhanational.org slash BIPOC. Today's speaker is Melanie Sunchef, who will be discussing protective factors for healing from trauma in BIPOC communities. As a reminder, we do not offer continuing education units, but we will provide information at the end regarding how to receive a certificate of attendance. Today's webinar will be recorded with both the recording and slides posted online within five business days. All attendees will be sent an email once these materials are posted. Melanie Funchess Melanie is currently employed by mental, the Mental Health Association of Rochester, Monroe County where she serves as the Director of Community Engagement and Family Support. Ms. Funchess has served as an advocate for families and youth for many years and has worked extensively in the area of family engagement and empowerment, as well as community building. She presents, trains, and consults locally and nationally in the areas of cultural competence, family engagement, community partnership building, racial trauma and healing, mental health and communities of color. Her two decades of work experience also include the areas of education, developmental disabilities, and community health. She also serves as school board commissioner for the Rochester Board of Education. I'm going to hand it over to Melanie now. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you, can everyone hear me? Yeah, you're good. All right, I just wanna make sure, am I clear? Awesome sauce, all right. All right, so, ooh, I, okay, y'all, I'm gonna let you know that I have, I have, I have technology issues, okay, because I'm learning how to use this, all right. Help me, somebody. Next slide, ooh, sorry, y'all, I'm with, all right, thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you. I first, in my tradition, before I begin, I it is my it is in my tradition that I must ask, I must honor the ancestors for on whose backs I stand and who are bring me this far along the way. And I also to have to give honor and ask for the elders for permission to speak. Now, because we are in this forum and I can't see people and people can't see me, I am going to out myself and say that I am 50. So I need someone who is over the age of 50 to give me permission to speak so I can go on. So all I need to say is someone to say, yes, Ashe, something. Thank you. There. So in our time today, what I want people to understand is we're going to get a fuller understanding of the need for healing because what we what I was asked to do is to talk about healing and BIPOC communities. And but I said we can't know, you know, what we're doing unless we know why we're doing it. So we're going to get a fuller understanding and to understand that I'm going to speak from the black experience because that is the one experience that I can speak authentically from. So while the the presentation is entitled BIPOC. I will speak authentic, oh, I'm sorry. BIPOC is Black, Indi Black Indigenous People of Color, Black Indigenous and People of Color. So it was an umbrella term that was created to make to encapsulate all of the different folks. So B for Black, I for Indigenous, and POC, People of Color. 
And so, and so as, um, and so what I will be doing is speaking authentically from the black space, because that is the space in which I live. And I want to give that voice and it is not authentic for me to give any other voice than that voice. And so in that, we're going to gain a full understanding of the need for healing and, cre and understand, increase the understanding of healing practices, primarily of Black people. But we're also going to talk about some things that are, there's some things that are common among our groups. In there, while there's a lot of things that are unique to our groups, but there's some things that are common. And talk about what makes this different from your traditional mental health treatment. And I'm going to share some examples and some stuff that we're doing here in Rochester and talk to you and highlights um, a place that you can go to find out about some, about some of the things that we're doing in Rochester and how you can bring those things to your community. Hey, I'm sorry. And, and by the way, I'm very, in, I'm very engaging and I'm not, this is not my typical way. I'm very interactive. So if I see you shout me out in the chat, I'm going to say hey to you. Okay, I'm clicking. I'm trying to go to the next slide. There. So, you know, do we need healing? You know, people say we need, you know, we're doing, we're going for justice, right? And in the era, in this latest era, you know, in this latest era in our quest for um, freedom, justice, and equality, we people say, do we need healing? Yes, and the answer is yes. And some people say, well, why, what's going on? And I'm, so I just wanna be clear because when something, unless something is explicitly said, it cannot be, you know, we can't assume that people understand. So shout out Rochester, hey. Um, so what I want people to understand is that this is a 401 year journey. Because when we're talking about, because right now we've been talking about healing in the current context, in the context of, you know, everything from Trayvon Martin to Eric Garner to George Floyd to Terry McDade to all the people whose names that we do not speak. But this is a 401 year journey, right? And I call it the dream deferred, right? From 1619 to 1865 was 246 years of chattel slavery. And what we know about epigenetics and the intergenerational transmission of trauma that is, there's things that were not resolved. And people say, well, emancipation came, but after that followed 100 years of Jim Crow. 100 years where there were no rights in the South and limited rights in the North. Then came in 19, 18, that's from 1865 to 1965. In 1965 came the Civil Rights Act, right? And that's 55 years. This happened I, you know, that is just, you know, a, a couple years before I, my time of birth. That's my mother's lifetime. That's my big sister's lifetime. And we're still in the struggle for full, for full freedom, justice, and equality. 400 years. And the fact of the matter is you cannot have equity without justice. And to have justice, you must have a reckoning for what has happened before. And in order to have healing, yes, mass incarceration and all the other things that have come up until. So when we understand, for us to understand why healing is needed, healing is needed because we, have, we need healing, one, because there has not been a full acknowledgement that a hurt has been done. Okay. I want, I put up this slide because people want to hear, you know, we're saying say their names. It would be a disservice for me to do this and talk about healing without us, without me giving at least a few of the names. So in this moment, I want to take a moment just a moment of silence in honor of these few names, a copy of these few names to give honor to those whose lives have been lost.
Thank you. The concept of healing is not new. These now these are some of the things that are that are um, common among different uh, communities. These concepts are not new. Healing practices have been with us since the beginning of time. We in each of our different communities, we have different approaches, and we have different approaches even within our communities that we use at different times for different um, situations. And all, but all of these things have common threads. But what one thing I need for people to understand is that the community has done this for themselves and can continue to do this for, for ourselves as long as we are provided the tools. When, when my ancestors were brought over in the ships, when they took away their drums, they used their hands and they made their body instruments. And yes, I will name Elijah McClain. Yes, I will name, I will say his name. I will say his name. I will say his name, Elijah McClain. I will say his name. You know, and my thing is, we, what I want people to understand, it is the time for us as communities of color, as black people, to become the owners of the tools of our own healing, because we've had the tools. We, if given the right, given the tools and given the resources, we can, we can heal, we can do the healing. We can do these healings for ourselves, and we have been doing them, but we've been doing them uh, on, a, on, on, a, on a piece of spit and a, and a string. So people say, well, what is the difference? Traditional mental health treatment, a lot of times it's office-based. Even though they say it's community-based, it's an office. You go to a place that's not your natural place of being, right? And the models are based on dominant culture norms. The dominant culture in America is white Eurocentric culture. So the models that are based, you know, the models that are Freud and Jung and Piaget and all, those are not, those are not models based where I come from. So those are dominant culture norms. I'm not shading them in any way, but they're not mine. The providers are often not the same community as the client. Okay, Men, when we know, what we know from the data is that if you take all of the black mental health professionals and wrap us all together, if you take the psychiatrists, psychologists, all the L's, LMSWs, LM, LCSWs, LMFTs, LMHCs, the nurse practitioners, all of us, we only make up 4%. So more than likely when we enter into those spaces, the provider that we get will not look like us. And the model is based on treatment. We call it mental health treatment. So it's not meant for you to heal. It's not designed that way. It's not designed for you to heal. It's designed for you to be treated, to put you in stasis. And it's based in head work, which means it's meant for you to think it through. The healing for our people does not come in the head. So we're gonna go into our healing practice. Our healing practices are based in the community. They're based in the places in which we live. They're born out of authentic cultural wisdom, models, and practices. These are the things that have been handed down from our elders and ancestors. The participants and the leaders of these practices are from the same community. They are authentic, trusted leaders. We know who they are because we eat, sleep, play, shop, worship with these people. The models are based on a concept of healing. The models are based in healing. That means to, to heal a thing versus to treat a thing. A healing is meant that you're gonna heal a thing. That means we're going to recover. That, we, that this thing is gonna be healed and that we're not gonna be sick anymore. It's not gonna, it's gonna keep us in treatment so that we're not dying. We're gonna be healed, so we're gonna be well, we're gonna be restored. And the, 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 the meat of this is heart work. 
to knit back and feel and heal the 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 hurts and the trauma and the 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 things that were done to the heart of man that have been passed down generation to generation to generation to generation. This is why there's such a difference in the types of work. Now, I've got to give honor to a recent ancestor. I will give him honor, I will give him honor, I will give him honor. I used to say when he was yet with us walking on this plane that he was my man crush every day in my mind. Dr. Carl C. Bell, I will say his name. He said risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. I will say it again, risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. If you don't know Carl C. Bell, you better find out, Google him, read his stuff. He is amazing. And I wanna give him, a, give a, the ancestor a shout out because his work, his work is transformative for our people. So, and reason I wanna say this, and I wanna stay here for a moment to talk about this, because what we need to understand is the risk factors for a lot of our people in communities, the things that have been done to us, the systemic things of redlining and, and, uh, and housing and mass incarceration and poor education and all these things are things that are taking, that are going to take generations to fix. They're gonna take time to fix. However, protective factors are things that we can do today. We can pile our youth up. We can raise up the protective factors right now by giving our youth positive racial identity development, by giving our youth to understand that a lie got told over 400 years ago, that we can tell them that they can defy the lie of, of white superiority and black inferiority, that they can understand who they are and where they come from. And by building up those protective factors that they can be well, because when you are well and you understand who you are and where you come from, you are less likely to participate in behaviors that will lead you to not being well. So I just want, that's what I want to say about that because we need to understand, we keep talking about our youth are at risk youth, our youth are at promise. It all depends on what you feed. What are we as the adults in the lives of young people, what are we feeding them? As the people and the leaders in the communities, in our villages, what are we feeding our people? Because what we feed is what will grow. Oops, sorry y'all. So what I'm gonna talk about is some examples of what we're doing. And I wanted to share this slide with these pictures because what we understand is in our communities, it's not just one way. You know, people try to say that the black community is a monolith and we're not. So in, in this slide, I wanted to show the different ways that we get down, right? We have meditation, we have yoga, we have the black church. Sometimes you, you know, I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal preacher's kid who believes in Oshun, right? I am my African ancestors and I am the child of Pentecostal preachers. I am both of those things, right? And I can lead, I am my ancestors wildest dreams personified because I am standing here to speak and bring our help, bring our people to the next place, right? I am standing on their backs and, and bringing out their next thing, right? And so, I understand that we can do these things in all these different ways and we need to do these things in all these different ways for we to get to, for us to get to liberation. And so in healing, you know, in understanding, Audre Lorde said that self-care is a revolutionary act. I may not be quoting the great ancestor quite correctly, but understanding that the healing, our healing is revolutionary in and of itself. So I wanna talk about two things that are currently happening in Rochester that are going and that we have started. The first one I wanna talk about um, are the emotional emancipation circles. 
I want to give a shout out to the Community Healing Network. If any of the members of Community Healing Network are on, on this webinar today, I want to shout you out. Y'all are bomb. Okay, the Community Healing Network and the Association of Black Psychologists, they are also bomb.com. They came together and created the Emotional Emancipation Circles. The Emotional Emancipation Circles are um, circles that are designed to heal from racial trauma by helping people to defy the lie of white superiority and black inferiority through you, the use of seven keys. We, um, uh, last year, last June, um, the Community Healing Network came, a team came and trained, we had 20 facilitators train in this model and we employed this model and we went through as a team, we went through the, um, the emotional emancipation process ourselves as a team for us to bond as a team. And just as we were getting ready to launch, COVID happened. And so in the wake of what, was, what we saw happening in our community with the disproportionate effects of COVID in our community, we said, we've got to launch. So we launched virtually. And so we launched virtually the Emotional Emancipation Circles. It's a black only space that meets over Zoom bi-weekly. And it's for um, adults. And then after the, and then um, it's an amazing space. I will talk about a little bit more about that later, but I just wanted to highlight it right now. And then um, after May 30th and the uprisings after George Floyd, we had uprisings here in Rochester as well. That, we, that Saturday, we had the uprisings here. That Sunday, we, a group of us were like, what about the children? What about the, the children are not all right. And so a group of us got together and said, how do we do this? And um, ju it just so happened that just previous to this, the Community Healing Network and all of the infinite wisdom that they got from the ancestors came about a thing called the Ubuntu Circles, which is a derivative of the Ubuntu Emancipation Circles. And we employed that to do Ubuntu Circles for our young people. Right, and so we did this with young people ages 12 to 19. Again, it's another black only space. It meets weekly. And this model is a hybrid model that we're doing. Half of the young people are meeting virtually over Zoom and half are socially distanced in a location in the community. Because some of our young people felt the need to be in space. They felt the need to be around, physically around other young people. So we found a space that was large enough for them to be there socially distanced. Everyone wears masks. There's plenty of, there's masks, there's hand sanitizer, there's lots of space. But we did it because we listened to our, we listened to our young people. And oh, define black only. Black only is only for people of, the African, of African descent. That's how we define black only, only for people of African descent. So that is the space. And so when we have um, spaces, these are spaces, and let me, let me be incredibly clear. When I, let me go back. Let me be very clear um, about the reason for this space. All right, let me, hold on. Let me, all right, I'm seeing questions. Hold on, y'all. Y'all coming fast and furious with me. Do we have the ability to connect with others not in our area? Um, these cir the, the Ubuntu circles are for youth in our area. They're specifically to address some of the issues that are happening in Rochester for Rochester youth. But if you want, but what I would ask you to do is I will connect you with Community Healing Network and I will help you in any way that I can to help you do it for your youth in your community. And are there other um, emotional emancipation circles? Yes, there are. If you go to, I, I, at the end of my presentation, I will, um, at the end of the presentation, there is a link for the, to, re, to go to the Community Healing Network's website where you can find that information. Okay, I am going to, this is what I'm going to say. If you are a person of African descent, that means if it, if, if you are a person of African descent, I cannot answer that for anybody but myself. 
If you look in your lineage and you are a person of African descent, and this is how we define our space, this space is for you. We, in our, in our group, in both of our groups, we have, we have Afro-Latinos in our groups, we have African immigrants in our groups, we have African Americans in our groups, we have Afro-Caribbean people in our groups, we have the key that we all have in common is that we're all people of African descent. And the thing is, is for you to, for people to identify that for themselves. That is not for me to identify for anybody. You know, and so the question came, I, I am, if I am mixed, do I fit in this space? What I'm going to say, and my thing is, this is my thing. There are people who the, who I debt there are for my what I've been told by my Latino brothers and sisters. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take this. I got time today. What I'm going to say to this is that I have what my Latino, but my Afro-Latino brothers and sisters have said to me is that they identify as Afro-Latina, Afro-Latino. And that is how that is why they feel comfortable in this space. Right? If you say that, if you identify as black. Black people know who they are. If you identify as black, black, because that's why I did not say African-American. African-Americans are a subgroup of black people. Black people are members of the diaspora. African-Americans are a subset of those people because African-Americans are African people, people of African descent who live in America. I want Afro, my black folks are my Bayesians. Black people include my my Jamaicans, my all those other folks, the diaspora. And I'm going to stay here. And if you identify that way, that is how you identify. That is not for me to tell you how you identify. That is not up to me at all. So I'm going, and that's how I'm going to leave that because my thing is people, there's people who will say, well, you tell me. I said, I can't tell you. I wasn't with your mom and your father when they got together in that room and I wasn't there when they was macking. So I'm just, I'm just going to keep, look, y'all, I'm going to tell you straight up, I keep it a buck all day long. I may have done all these things, but I'm, I'm a straight Bronx chick, okay? I'm going to keep it a buck with you. I cannot define for you who you are. I know I'm a black woman all day long. My, my daddy was Bama. My mama is Caribbean. That's who I am and that's how I identify. So let's move on. Oh, oh previous. Okay, I did it right. Sorry, y'all. What we're getting ready to launch now are village teachings. The re these teachings, what we found in our community, particularly among some of our younger people, is that they didn't know who they are and they didn't know who they, where they came from. So what we're, we're launching, what we're calling village teachings, and they're serving two purposes, right? They're building positive racial identity development because we're teaching, we're teaching ourselves knowledge of self and knowledge of our community. And it's a second thing because it's not just us it's us teaching ourselves. So what we're doing is we're bringing the elders of our community and, and we're bringing other people of our community to teach others in our community, not just our global history, but our local history. You know, there's stuff in our local black history that people who've grown up in our community don't know. So it's not only to teach them the content, but to teach our people that everything we need is already in the house. We need to have pride because all this knowledge exists already within us. So it's not only are you taking pride in learning new information, getting new knowledge, but you should get the pride in knowing that you didn't have to go outside. We didn't have to pay somebody to come from out of town to teach it to us. It is in us. It's right here in River City. It's right here in Rochester. For us locally, it's right here in Rochester, right? And the, what the beauty of this is, is that because it comes from within your community, it is the people speak our cult. They know to speak the culture and speak the language of your people. They know how to design it for your people. They can speak the direct language because in our city we have a thing about east siders and west siders, right? And depending on you know what generation you're from, you could talk about the thing about the east siders and the west siders, right? But it's always been a thing about east siders and west siders, right? And when we talk about the when you talk about the story. 
like today, um, we're getting ready to lay to rest uh, um, a giant in our community. You know, Elder um, Dave again t um, transitioned to become an ancestor, right? And he is being laid to rest tomorrow, and his um, they're beginning his home going today. And but the thing is, is that people the way they know him now is not the way that people of a different generation know him. So we need the elders to come in to teach this story, right? And so that is the te the purpose of the teaching is to be able to not only teach the actual content that we want them to know, whether it be African world history, whether it be the links of Frederick Douglass to Rochester, because we are the land of Douglas here, whether it, whether it be Austin Stewart or our links into our being an underground railroad stop, whether those things, or it's about, you know, the links to us in New York City in the LGBT, Black LGBTQ, um, uh, fight for liberation, no, no matter what it is, it's being taught by our people. And then it can also create linkages across, uh, across generational linkages, because the overarching thing about this is to rebuild the village. Understand, all of this has, has one goal, to rebuild the village. The next thing that we're also launching are sister sister intergenerational learning and healing circles. Historically, in our communities, younger women were taught by the older women. And somewhere there was a break in the intergenerational transmission of culture and knowledge. What we are seeking to do in this is to re-knit that, um, re -knit that, that, that tie. But there has to be both learning and healing to go on both ways. And when that and that recognition, we are bringing the generations together. So myself and some younger sisters, we're coming together to bring together the, the sisters of multiple generations so that we can learn and teach one another. This is a reciprocal thing. Understand. This is reciprocal because it's learning, loving, healing, and growth both ways. Because a lot of times we always think of the elders teaching the young, but it's both ways. All because we as people of the African diaspora, we are relational people. Our highest value lies in relationship and relationships must be reciprocal. And we, and our bonds as women have been they have been protective of us, they've been protective for us. The bonds of sisterhood have been protective for generations and we want to bring these back. And we're going to have to do it together. And so what we're going to do is we're building, we're, we're in the process of really building this as we go. So we will, seasoned women, seasoned is the term that I use for women who are, um, are considered elders. Women of a certain age, I don't use the term because I use the term seasoned personally, that's a personal term that I use because Eurocentric culture does not value eldership in the same way that, that black folks value eldership. So when I say elder, a lot of times it's not heard the same way. So I use seasoned because once you've been around a while, You've been seasoned. You've, you've had some things happen and your life has become more seasoned because you've experienced more things and more things have come to you. So that's the term I use. And I shouldn't say season. It should say seasoned. So seasoned women are women of a certain age. So when you look at the picture that I have up here, the sister in the middle is a seasoned sister. Yes, women, seasoned women, yes, a woman of a certain age. And, and I say a certain age because seasoning is not necessarily dictated by a chronological age. Just like eldership, a lot of times to eldership, people ascribe it to the age of 60 or the age of retirement, but different people because of the, the environment or whatever, they reach that in different times. So we, I don't like to ascribe numbers because that's not the way, that's not the way we work. The whole, and I'm sorry, y'all, I have a dog. Um, the whole purpose of this is for us to be able to 
um, the whole purpose of this is for us to be able to bond ourselves together and to come back together as women because women are the backbone of the community and if we're not together we're not well so like i said i'm going back to the um emotional emancipation typically we have right now we it meets every other week we keep about a hundred people we're over a hundred now people who are registered attendance ranges in our eec circles from about 45 to 60 people the age range is from 20 to seven, literally like 20 to like 70 years of age. Some people are over 70, but I'm a cap it at 70 because I don't want to out folks, right? The group is very interactive for being large, but people want smaller groups because they want to be more intimate. But what the something that people said is that even though the groups were large, they felt very safe. People were like, I cannot believe this is what I needed. I needed this. And I and and people were like, oh my God, I can't believe I needed this. And people were able to speak, and they felt safe to speak the things that were going on for them in this space, which we were, which was what we really, really wanted and needed, because we wanted to have happen because we were worried about it because it was virtual. And one of the ways that we make sure that this happens in the virtual space, because you know how you go on virtual meetings, and sometimes people don't show. Um, they all they mute their video, they close their video so you can't see them. What we do is we call it we call it family check. We ask everybody to show to show their face. But when they enter the group at least once, you can go off. What gender we usually have more of in the groups? There are there's usually more women, but there's a lot of guys. Believe it or not, there's a lot of guys, but we do usually have more women in the groups. Um, but I'm gonna come to that because I realized that I forgot a, a whole group in this presentation I'm gonna talk about, um, that I'm gonna talk about even though it's not listed in my slides. Um, other than creating the safe space, what is the format? Is it like a talking circle with no set topics or there specific topics? The EECs have a set, the EECs themselves have a set order. It's the mo they it's a model. Emotional emancipation circles are a model, and we use the emotional emancipation circle model in the um in the meetings every week. They have seven keys, and we you we go through the keys every week, and so that's that's the model that we use. So if you so when I get at the when I get to the end of the presentation, if you go to Community Healing Network and get information, you can find out about that, and that's the model that we use. So yes, it's a it's a, it's a structured model that we do use every week, and we but we allow but it, it's a model that allows space for people to be able to to share. The difference between this and the Ubuntu circle for the young people, we cap it at twenty, because we know that our young people need that space. How can we start a group? I'm in Illinois. When we get when I get to the slide. <laughs> Um, you can reach out to the Community Healing Network. And I'm going to keep shouting about the Community Healing Network. You can reach out to them. Miss Enola Aird um, is the leader of Community Healing Network. Miss Enola, um, Nana Tawade, and Baba Mosi, they're all there. Um, how long does it take to get the training? I'm going, okay. What I'm going to tell you all is to please reach out. I, to please reach out to Community Healing Network. Please, please, y'all. I know that these, look, I told y'all it's bomb, but they can answer all your questions. They're gonna be mad at me because I'm sending them a million and one people all at once, but they are bomb and they can do it, right? Is How is this different from rites of passage? Okay, we also have rites of passage in our community. This is, how is Ubuntu different from rites of passage? Is that the question? April? Okay. Ubuntu is di is very different from rites of passage. Um, rites of passage is a structured thing to take you to take you through to bring is it's very structured to take you through a particular process. Ubuntu is specifically like to give you support to deal with the issues of the day. We use emotional emancipation as a model, but it's a, it's about you learning about yourself, but it's about also dealing with the issues that youth are going through right now. 
So many of a lot, some of the youth that are in Ubuntu have already been through rites of passage. You know, that it's something to help, like what the reason Ubuntu was started was a lot of our youth who were involved in the uprisings um, of May 30th, they were feeling some kind of way, that, that for lack of a better term, they were feeling some kind of way and they needed a place to process. We created these circles to give them a place to process, process not only what they experienced, but what was being said about them versus, and to talk to them about who they are versus what was being said about them. Thank you, sis. Thank you for putting the link in. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to the last slide, but thank you for putting the link in. So now what I want to say about this uh, hybrid model that we're using, the 50-50 split between the live and the virtual, it is presenting its unique challenges. Um, is that, you know, sometimes the people who are in space, you know, to, mod to be able to model um, uh, balance between who is speaking, because you can't, you know, we're, we've got multiple cameras so everybody can see everybody. You know, we have multiple laptops working in the ver in the live space so everyone can see everybody. And so it presents some unique challenges. You're welcome. Um, presents some unique challenges, but we are committed to trying to do this to make everyone be able to engage in the way that feels safe for them. The young people look forward to the group. When I see them at, um, here we're doing ev actions every week. So I'm at the actions every week. And they're like, Mama Mel, are we going, are we, are you, are we doing, we're doing Ubuntu this week? Yep, we're doing Ubuntu this week. And so they're really wanting to do it. And what they're using it for, what the young people are actually using this for, is a way to draw other young people. As a way to draw other young people who they see to bring them to make positive behavior change. When they're saying, look, I want y'all to come in and start becoming activists as to channel the way you're feeling about what's going on. They want to bring them into Ubuntu circles to learn to be able to help their, their peers. Which is some, which is a byproduct that we didn't see in the, we didn't think about, but that's what the young people are using it for. All right, can you explain more about emotional emancipation? And address more about racial trauma, especially pertaining to racial un unrest with Black death. Okay. Okay. The key with emotional emancipation is with well, the emotional emancipation circle is the the base the the most basic way to say is over 400 years ago a lie got told based upon a lie being told the lie that got told was a lie of white superiority and black inferiority based upon that lie systems were built systems were built uh, studies were done, things were done, and things were done progressively to maintain this lie. And if you know that a lie keeps getting told, a lie keeps getting told, a lie keeps getting told, eventually people will believe the lie to be the truth. Not only the people who keep telling the lie, but the people who are being lied on. So what is happening is people have, been, people have experienced this racial trauma and we need healing. And there's multiple types of healing that are needed. Because not only are we experiencing the, uh, the, the trauma of black death from police brutality and the things like that are being addressed by Black Lives Matter, we're experiencing black death by proximal crime, crime within our communities. Because, and it's, but it's all stemming from the same thing, from a lie that got told. And so, and I want to say this, when I say proximal crime, let me explain, that's proximity-based crime because black-on-black -black crime is not a thing. I'm going to say it again. Black-on-black -black crime is not a thing. When people commit crime, people get into conflict. Let me say this. People get into conflict with people who they are in close proximity to. And because we live in America in a hyper-segregated society, people are most likely to be close to people who look like them. And when you take people and you concentrate them into places close together and you deprive them of resources, 
food deserts, inadequate education, inadequate housing, generation after generation after generation, underemployed, unemployed, these things create conflict and who did, and then you box them in, do not let them go anywhere. They get into conflict. Who are they gonna get into conflict with? The people who are in the spaces with them. And who are the people who are in the spaces with them? People who look like them. So those people happen to be also in the places where people are black, those people also have to be black. But the same is true in those places where people are poor and white. The other people happen to be poor and white. But no one's talking about white on white crime. Now this is not on my slide, y'all. Y'all getting this for free, okay? So, um, so what I'm saying is, People need to heal both from, I'm watching my time, people need to heal both from the state-sanctioned violence of the state-sanctioned violence of brutality from people who are, set, who are paid with our tax dollars to protect and serve, but also the violence from within our communities that are both perpetuate, perpetuations of white supremacy. If there are questions, let me know. So this is why we need healing because we need healing from the first one, but we also need healing from the second one because the reason that this is being, this is happening because we don't know, because our we don't know who we are. So because if you don't know and you have not been taught who you are, you will believe what you are taught. And if you are being taught that you are less than, if you're being taught that you are inferior, if you're being taught that you are inherently violent, you will believe that thing. If you are taught that your, your life does, has no value, you will perpetuate that thing which is taught to you. So what all these things that we are seeking to do are to uh, help you to unlearn, because understand, all these things are learned behaviors. Anything that is learned can be unlearned. If you are taught to be powerless, you will think you are powerless, but it's a learned behavior. And if it's learned, it can be unlearned. All that we need to do is to teach, to teach, to teach. We as the adults in the lives of young people, we as the elders in the lives of adults, we as the young, older children in the lives of younger children, our role is to model and teach, our role is to model and teach. This is what we are to do. If we are to rebuild the village, This is what we need to do. And this is not in my slide, y'all. Y'all don't got me going, okay? Um, I, was, I was intending to give a very, very you know, normal presentation. Um, so what's next? Because I'm looking at my time. What's next? We are expanding our capacity for Ubuntu circles. Um, more EECs, doing village teaching, create more spaces for intergenerational learning and healing. But something I want to highlight that we're also doing currently, we have another EEC circle that's doing, it's called Something for the Brothers, that is strictly for Black men. It's strictly for Black men. This is, you know, strictly, and, we, and people say, well, how do you identify men? Men get to identify themselves, okay? I don't, I, we don't, like, just like I don't identify who black, I don't identify who a man. So they have, they meet, uh, like I said, the EECs meet on every other Thursday. On the off Thursday of the EECs, something for the brothers meets. And it's all brothers in this space doing this thing. And what they, and they use the EEC model, but what they're focused on also is define the lie of toxic masculinity. Saying that we, that men can lean on other men for support. Men can say that they have need. Men can say, you can cry, you can say you have need, you can say that you can, you don't have to be strong all the time. You can say all these things, but it's in a space where it's only brothers. I've never been in a space, don't want to go in a space, have no desire to be in the space, because it ain't for me. 
you know, and, and, but what I want to say about this, we were talking about building a space before COVID happened. And what we learned is we were doing this, um, I was doing the research with some brothers about building a space and the brothers had never had a space without sisters in it. Cause we bring the food, we clean up. And I said, wait a minute, nah, 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 nah. This cannot be cause sisters, we'll kick y'all out. We'll have y'all put the tables up and carry in the heavy stuff and kick y'all out right quick like. So, my thing is, no, we can't have this. And they were like, well, how? I said, don't worry, we'll figure it out. But you need to be honored with your own space. And it was, uh, and it was, un and the brother said, sis, this is unfamiliar for us. I said, you'll get used to it. You'll be okay. And they did it. And they were like, this was so, and the brothers were like, this was so amazing. The first time they had 20. And the next time they had like 35 and they're growing. And I'm, and I'm so, I don't know what the, I, I've stopped checking on them. So I don't know where they're at now, but they were like, they, they were like, they called it spiritual. The brothers call it spiritual. So I just wanted to make sure I highlighted my brothers because I cannot leave my brothers out. I love my Kings. I love my Kings. And I honor my Kings. So I didn't want to leave them out. But like I said, um, I, what we're doing now is we're expanding our capacity. I'm trying to bring community, community healing network. I'm bringing them back to Rochester because I need more facilitators because we are stretching our people thin because we're realizing in this space because of the onslaught of, of things that are happening now, our people need more spaces to heal. And what we're trying to do now is do affinity healing. So what, I'm, what I mean by affinity healing is we're creating specific space for LGBT black folks for them to get healing in their own space because there's space, things that are specific to that community that they can do the thing but there's things that they need to speak of within the tribe so we want to have that we want to have specific spaces for younger folks specific spaces for our for our elders so they can have a space to talk about their own specific stuff as well as spaces for us all to be together and so we're doing all those things We need more, we need these models to for, very badly in Philly. There are there programs for leaders to promote from the top. Decrete, wait, 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 wait. Uh, to grow up on the fun. I'm sorry, y'all, I'm reading. Um, wait a minute, let me, all right, let me finish. Hold on, I'm going to go to your comments. Hold on, because I think, I think I'm at the end. So yes, for more information on these practices, go to the Community Healing Network. The sisters shared it in the chat. And this is me. So y'all get to see what I look like. I'm, ain't, I, ain't I cute, y'all? I, I like this picture. So, ain't I cute? So, uh, but um, I want y'all to know you can reach out to me. I know I'm running out of time, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And reach out to me. My email is there. That is actually my cell phone. You can text me. I'm on Facebook under my government name. You can hit me on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Um, you can hit me on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Does anyone have any questions left that haven't been answered yet? The, all right, you want to go back to the contact slide. Let's see. Uh, oh, ooh, I don't know what I'm doing. Sorry. Wait. So she wants to go back to the contact slide. Thank you, darling. Ooh. Are we sharing slides? Yes, the slides and the recording will be emailed out to everyone who registered within five business days. It depends on how long everything takes to get online. But it should be pretty quickly. 
Well, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I know it was a lot. I raced through, but I want to say thank you. I, I hope that I was, um, I'll try to be as interactive with y'all as I could. And y'all are bomb. Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you to MHA National for this opportunity. Hush dog. I want to say thank you to MHA National for this opportunity. Because, um, you know, the, the fact that you all were open to have a presentation like this is really amazing. And it's a testament to Paul and the work that you all do. Thank you so, 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 so much. Uh, we did get one question about what role the church can play in these community-based groups. Oh, like the, the church can play. Oh, there, there are so many roles for the church to play. Um, the church can host circles. The church, um, the church can host places of healing. I have done direct work. Uh, with churches on around creating healing, not th not necessarily these particular healing circles, but I've been doing this work for a long time. Um, that around this, and I and I have partnered with churches for a long, long time. If you want to um, send me an email, and I can talk to you further about that, there is a definite, clear, clear role for the Black Church. They have been at the forefront of this forever, and we need them. So we need y'all. And like I said, I'm a, I'm, a pre, I'm a Pentecostal preacher's kid. And to say that, my mama was the preacher. So, um, so please, please reach out and we can talk about that. Another question we got was how to integrate the majority of the population into this and debunk and how to go about debunking the myth of educating the mental health community and engaging them in the healing process at odds with each other. Wait, say that again, darling. <laughs> so the question is how to integrate it with the majority of the population uh, because of the myth that educating the mental health community is kind of counter to engaging in the actual healing process. Well, what I would say is I do so I do some of that work, but my thing is is that I think it's up to it. It's up to the, the dominant culture, mental health community to get educated. Your data, the data of the community tells you that the stuff doesn't work. The disparities have been clear for decades. Why It is insanity to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So my thing is, is that go to look. There, has, there, have, been, there have been people in this space Go to NABSW, the National Association of Black Social Workers. Go to ABCI and ask them. These people have been around for years. Ask them. Ask them. You know, my thing is, is that, you know, it is not, I, it's not my job to do the emotional labor to educate white folks on how to how to do this my thing is is that i am getting my the time that i have left i am spending it on helping to heal black people that is where i'm at that's where i'm at at this point because the the, the knowledge exists there are two amazing organizations there is the Amer the association of black so black psychologists and the national association of black social workers we have, there are incredible scholars within both of those organizations who have done decades and decades and decades and decades of work in the academy. Read a, read a peer reviewed study. Go to the academy, get the knowledge, go to the journals, read and ask them. That's all the time that we have for right now. Thank you so much to Melanie for her incredibly engaging presentation. And thank you to all of the attendees. We will be emailing out the slides and the recording soon. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.